Dora Thornton is um, one of senior curators in the British Museum and is curator of Renaissance Europe. Um, and Dora has um, undertaken several major projects for the British Museum, um, including a, a mammoth um, um, catalogue of the museum's Italian ceramics. Um, many of you may have been, um, four years ago now, to uh, the British Museum in 2012 when there was a marvellous exhibition on Shakespeare and his world, which was curated by Dora and Jonathan Bate. Um, uh, Dora also has, I hope, the good fortune to be married to me, which is very nice. <laughs> uh, uh, Tom Corrington doesn't have that. <laughs> but um, Tom is um, a rising star in the world of architecture. Um, he's been working for the last five years um, for Stanton Williams, which is one of the best uh, known names in, in modern architecture in Britain and beyond today. And Stanton Williams were one of two architectural firms um, very heavily engaged in the project which Tom and Dora are going to be talking about today, the other being Purcell, Miller, Tritton. Um, so they are going to talk about the uh, redisplay of the Wadston bequest in a new dedicated gallery at the British Museum. And this is, I think, a very special project in three ways. Um, first way is that normally in museums, whenever you're trying to do an exhibition or put on a gallery um, or refurbish something, you spend your time rattling a very big begging bowl and it's very, very hard work raising the money. Um, fortunately, because this was a project um, in collaboration with the Rothschild Foundation, that for once wasn't a problem. <coughs> the second way in which it's special, and I think you'll see this very much from the talk, is the astounding quality of the treasures in the Watson Bequest, uh, which Baron Ferdinand Rothschild left to the nation. Um, and thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, I think, I hope you all agree at the end of this talk, that the outcome of this project was very, very special indeed. And it's something I hope you all want to rush off to Bloomsbury to enjoy, um, if you haven't already been to it. So, Dora and Tom. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy. It's not very often I get introduced by my husband, and it's a very nice thing. Um, good afternoon, and I hope you can hear us at the back. If at any point you can't, please wave your arms around, um, and that will respond as well as we can. It's a great privilege to be here to talk about a new gallery for the British Museum, for the Wadston Request, which, as Jeremy said, is funded by the Rothschild Foundation, and which opened in June last year. We're going to give a rather different kind of talk about the gallery, uh, because we're here as curator of the project and of the gallery and as project architect to give you some kind of insight into the working, the creative process of making a gallery. It was a very happy collaboration over three years between our two organisations, uh, funded by the Rothschild Foundation, and we're very pleased to give you some sort of insight into that process. What we hope will come out of it is that you will have much, a much better understanding of what it takes to create a free, public, permanent gallery in one of our great museums. And perhaps that will enhance your experience of visiting not just the Watson Quest Gallery, but other galleries in Britain and in London. So that is what we're aiming to do today. Of course, we're only two of the 10 interlocking teams that it took to make this gallery. I think we were on each of the teams when we talked. Um, so, 10 interlocking teams involving people with very, very different skills and experience, all of them extremely valuable. So, I hope that gives you some immediate sense of just how complex and how intense this work has been over three years. And it's going to be great fun to share some of our insights with you. So, first of all, the Watterson Bequest itself. I'm not going to talk very much about the objects, the collection, or its history, because it's not that kind of talk. But I hope you will go and see the gallery. At the moment, it is, however, shut while we do conservation checks on some of the objects. It will reopen on the 1st of February, so please don't turn up at the British Museum as a result of this talk and find it shut until the 1st of February when it reopens. 
Uh, this is just one snapshot of the first case that you see in the new gallery as you enter the room. And it's really just there to show you that we've tried to arrange the collection as a sculptural whole. It's there to show you the richness and the variety of these incredible objects, which are all medieval or Renaissance, with some 19th century fakes and forgeries involved as well, um, which really do, I think, as a whole, give you an insight into the fashioning, the self-fashioning of a new dynasty in the 19th century. I'm sure you all know that the rise of the Rothschilds from the Frankfurt ghetto to become bankers to the world within two generations of the 19th century is one of the classic rags to riches stories. And the collection really does give one a sense of what that is and what that means. Um, as soon as the Rothschilds made any money, they started to invest in art, but they lived with the art they collected. <coughs> and every single piece that they owned had a political and a social life within their mansions. And we want to give you a sense of that as we go through the tour. Baron Ferdinand left us this extraordinary collection, the Watson Request, at his death in 1898, according to the terms of his will. And it's always been on permanent public display in the British Museum. He named it after his neo-Renaissance mansion, Waddesdon Manor, which is still to be visited as a wonderful living Rothschild creation. It's run by Lord Rothschild and the Rothschild Foundation on behalf of the National Trust. And perhaps many of you have visited. If you haven't, I really recommend it to you. On the left, you see an 1897 photograph taken of Baron Ferdinand in the last year of his life, sitting in one of the classic rooms at Wadston, the Baron's room, surrounded by the kind of luxury to which he was accustomed, with his dear dog Poupon at his feet. He's surrounded by 18th century British portraits of reigning beauties and 18th century French furniture. This is the kind of way in which he lived at Wadston. And on the lower right, you see Watson is still to be visited today as you walk across the lawn towards the entrance. But within his mind as a collector and within the interiors at Wadston, this collection, the Watson Request, had a very particular role and a very special kind of display. He arranged a special room for it, the new smoking room, in 1896. And for the last two years of his life, it was displayed there. So you have to imagine these objects seen through wreaths of cigar smoke in the smoking room at Wadston. It was a near Renaissance interior, the only one at Wadston, and he called it his Renaissance Museum. I think he long intended it to come to the British Museum afterwards as a kind of museum collection. And it's very different from all the other rooms in the house in being a Renaissance stage set for a certain kind of corporate entertaining. And you see on the right, one of the cases as he arranged it at Wadston, he would have unlocked these vitrines he had a key on him, and he would have unlocked these vitrines and taken out for you, the, the elite visitor, uh, one of the objects and shown it to you and told you its story. So you have to imagine him as the curator of this collection, someone who arranged his collections aesthetically, we'll talk about that as we go along, and who really was uh, the person who curated and looked after the display. <coughs> so it had a very, very special role within his own mind and at Wadston. Uh, what do you do with a collection like this when it comes into the public domain in a public museum? Well, it's been on display since 1898 in a series of galleries. Um, in the 1970s, we put it uh, on the first floor, and those, that is the old display that we've now taken apart and recreated on the ground floor of the British Museum. That really happened because uh, Lord Rothschild approached Neil McGregor, the director of the British Museum, until very recently. Uh, their old friends, and thought between them that it was a good time to remake and reinterpret the collection. It was also a good moment because a very suitable space was available on the ground floor of the museum. We'll talk about that in a minute. So we went through the process of appointing the architects to work with us on this project, and we had a competition, and Stanton Williams Architects emerged as the winners of that competition. So we started work at the end of 2012. In order to appoint the architects, we prepared a custom brief, and I wanted to just create one sentence out of that, which I think gives a sense of what the gallery was aiming to do. How to create a sense of wonder and connection to both the craftsmen who made the objects and the people who collected them. And that's where Stanton Williams came in, so I'll hand you over to Tom. Thank you, Dora. Um, so for, this was, for us, this was a really good opportunity. It was our first chance to work as a practical. Sure, sorry. Um, Is that better? Can you hear me now? 
So for us, this was a really good opportunity. It's our first time as a practice working in the British Museum, and of course with a very enlightened cultural funder, the Rothschild Foundation. As Dora said, and Jeremy also, it was about two and a half to three years of very intense work, and Paul Williams, the director of the company, and myself, really enjoyed the collaboration that we had with the British Museum team and those at Walston Manor. I think some of you may find it a little bit surprising to find architects involved in this particular kind of very detailed exhibition display work. So I'll give you a little brief um, introduction to our practice. Um, so Stanton Williams Architects, um, based in Angel, um, we're about a hundred of us, and we work in a huge range of projects, um, from housing to research and education buildings. But at the core of what we do is um, cultural projects. Um, so um, our director, Paul Williams, um, before setting up the practice, had a long distinguished career already as an exhibition designer. And alongside buildings that you see on the top left here, which is the Sainsbury's Plant Science Laboratory in Cambridge, which won the Sterling Prize a few years ago, you also see things such as the um, Bronze Exhibition at the Royal Academy on the top right, and just know that the Giacometti Exhibition at the National Portrait Gallery, which was on very recently. And we work on a whole range of uh, other museum projects as well, currently working on the uh, refurbishment and extension of the Musée des Beaux-Arts in Nantes. And the reason why exhibitions and galleries are so interesting to us is that they're very immediate, very experiential projects. They give us a chance to test out ideas which we can then apply in our architecture in a much more condensed time frame than we would normally do in a building. We're looking at the same ideas of how light acts in the space, how people move through a space and different thresholds understanding details. And all these ideas from the exhibitions then feed back into our larger building projects. An exhibition and a gallery space is always a compromise, really, between the objects and the space in which they sit. Um, so every exhibition and gallery project we're looking at is a very simultaneous process, working both outwards from the, the objects to understand their own display needs as to how they can be shown, and inwards from the space in which they will be situated to understand how that space may be uh, repurposed for its new use. And so this, pro this process is con constantly going back on itself, retesting ideas that we looked at earlier, and trying to work out if things have worked out properly. And it's a very sort of, uh, we're working at every different scale simultaneously, from the scale of these small objects, those of the display cases, the room, the interpretation, all at once. I think one of the things we very much want to get across is that you don't have um, a concept or a brief or research or something like this, which you then hand over to the architects and they come up with a scheme and then you just sort of slot the objects in somehow. That's not how it works at all, and that's the most important thing I think we want to convey, is how closely we've had to work together with these 10 interlocking teams to make the whole thing grow organically to create a new gallery space. So as Dora said, the brief was really about trying to look at objects, at least the initial brief we had, and so we spent a long time with Dora and her team at the museum trying to understand every object. And I think. Um, when you handle a real object, you have that wonderful vantage point of being able to look at its minutiae from every angle and really appreciate all the detail. As soon as that's put in a display case, um, that really immediately compromises that object because it, your possible viewpoints are immediately fixed or reduced depending on where it sits in the case. So in these initial weeks and months, we're really spending a long time trying to understand with the curator and her team what do you really want to see about each object? Is it, for example, the, an inscription on the rim of a cup? Is it the form of the object? Is it a bit of the material there? Mm -hmm. And so we're really trying to understand very carefully so that we can position each object to its optimum position. And we also had the really good opportunity to understand how the old display worked. So on the right here, you see um, the previous gallery, which is in the upper level of the, gal of the museum and understand what wasn't working about the lighting, what wasn't working about the different materials, and also what did work. I think for us, um, and for many people, I think the Watson Bequest, when you first come across it, is quite a bewildering array of objects. Um, there's a huge range of different materials, um, different object types of sizes and weights, um, and on top of that, there's a whole range of different narrative stories. There's not a simple story which can be drawn out from them. And additionally, all the different conservation requirements, so different um, relative humidities in which things can be displayed, or light levels. And so for us, this was a big challenge, I think, working with Dora to understand what was the story of this gallery, what were we trying to get across with people. 
didn't see it. We were learning very, very fast from the objects, working together to accumulate all the different sorts of data that we required in order to work out these compromises that Tom mentioned, of how to display things to their best advantage so you can see them, understand their scale, get a sense of their history, relate them to other objects, and also conserve them properly. And of course, the close work with um, Dora and her team and those at Watson Manor really helped us understand this collection. So on the left-hand side here, you see an uh, image from contemporary Baron Ferdinand's day of how they were displayed in the smoking room at Watson Manor. And I think one of the first things you can see from this is that the collection there is very clearly not trying to tell a story as such. There's a, a mixture of different objects types all together, and there's a mixture of Islamic objects, Jewish, Christian, all together in one space. But what's really driving this collection, as well, to what we understand it really, is the aesthetic arrangement of it. So Baron Ferdinand is using symmetry here to display his objects in really a sculptural form, uh, and that for us was really important. And of course, the proximity of this gallery, the, uh, the display, and the ability to uh, reach out and touch and handle the objects was really important. And I think those two, this, this idea of the aesthetic design, and also that being able to be very close to the objects, were the two really key ideas for us when we were looking at design. And now this gallery, as Dora said, um, has been taken from the first floor of the museum and brought down to the ground floor of the museum. And this is really important, bringing it down to the, uh, much more onto the main visitor circulation route of the museum. Um, it's in what's called the middle room, and that was at the end of the King's Library. So the King's Library was built in 1827, it's one of the first parts of the British Museum. And it was the King's Library, then later the British Library. And when the British Library moved to St Pancras in the late 1990s, these rooms all have so been repurposed into exhibitions and galleries. Um, and the middle room, I think, is the last of those to be transformed, really. Um, yes. This is much more, though, than just moving the collection down from the first floor to the ground floor, making it more accessible to the visitor. Because we've really changed its place within the history of the museum. It's on the, what is now effectively a new display spine for the British Museum, which really starts with the Enlightenment Gallery, which you see on the top right, uh, remodeled in 2003 <coughs> in the old King's Library, which really presents you with the story of how, rather like Jeremy was saying in the introduction about the Society of Antiquaries, how we have understood ourselves and our past and our past societies through the study of objects, something which links the British Museum very strongly with the Society of Antiquaries. And this Enlightenment Gallery does that um, as from 2003. From that, you walk into the old manuscript saloon, which is uh, the photograph on the lower right, and that was remodeled in 2014 as Collecting the World. It takes that story of collecting and collectors and the study of objects into the 21st century. So this new room, where the Watson Bequest is, was the old uh, reading room of Dickens and Thackeray and the great novelists of the 19th century. And it benefits from that sense of calm and connectedness of a library room and the rather humane proportions, which we'll talk about more in a minute. So you're moving through these wonderful, grand, humane library spaces um, for this new display spine, presenting the British Museum as a collection of collections and giving this collection, the Watson Bequest, which is the only collection that has to be legally shown on its own in a named room, a completely different prominence within the history of the museum. Wonderful too, not just that sense of a new history for the bequest, but also being able to do what Baron Ferdinand Rothschild wanted us to do in the terms of his will in 1898, which is to call it the Waddesdon Bequest and make that connection with Waddesdon Manor a living and meaningful thing. Obviously, digital uh, media gives you a completely new way of making that connection with Waddesdon. And it's through the digital media, both in the gallery and on the web, that we've really made that connection live for the 21st century in a completely new way. Just to show you, as you walk through, this is walking through from the Enlightenment Gallery through Collecting the World, you see this picture of Wadston Manor backlit above the door of the gallery, which invites you into this completely new space of Wadston and its collection. So alongside all this detailed work for looking at the objects themselves, we're also trying to understand the space itself. So as Dora said, this is the middle room here. And we have the fortune that as, the, as it hasn't had a permanent use since the British Library moved out, we were able to access this gallery throughout the project. And we were therefore able to understand exactly how the room really functions and how it works. So understand how the daylight changes throughout the seasons and across the day. 
and understand the scale of the room and the proportions, the rhythms of these bookcases which line the room, and importantly, I think, for us, really try testing out our designs in the gallery space itself. So you'll see here on the floor, for example, we taped out these forms of showcases to understand how they fit within the space and how you might move around them. And of course, we're able to then bring objects into the space and see again how they respond with that kind of environment and light. And we started the project then a lot with, alongside this detailed object work, as we do with all our other architectural projects. So we do perspective sketches and physical models, trying to understand how the space works. With this initial idea, we're really trying to look at how people move around the space, the kind of flows you have there, so that you can have somebody standing on one side looking at a, as an object on a display case this side, and on the other side looking at an object there, and people can walk in between them and not then be interrupted, and so it doesn't feel too congested, <coughs> what kind of route people might take around them. We're also trying to get this feel of the Schatz camera and a bit of that kind of uh, that kind of um, atmosphere really into the design at a very early stage. And a very important bit at this stage is already to understand the fit of the objects in the gallery. So we really had to make sure that the collection would fit in the case we designed. Um, so there's a lot of that just detail work in there already. At the beginning, a lot of my colleagues said, how can you use a large room like the middle room to display only 265 objects, which is what the Wadsden Quest includes, but actually, it's not one cubic centimetre too large by the time you've worked out the design <laughs> for the gallery. And the way we work out how it fits is to actually draw every single object. So all the objects were drawn uh, in-house over about a month and a half. Um, some poor uh, assistant <laughs> drawing them for us, but very well. Um, and we, they're drawn in plan, section and elevation views, so we can really understand every object from every uh, vantage point. And then by laying these out um, on the computer in a row, you can very quickly understand, for example, if they're set this far apart, you need 90 metres of showcase. If they're set closer together, you need less. And so it's a really quick way of understanding how those earlier design options we showed you can actually work in the space and making sure things fit. And this way of these drawings were also used with Dora and her team to understand the grouping. So we started to use these as a very quick way of moving objects around, seeing how they can fit together. It was a very interesting process for me as well because it's a completely different way of thinking about the objects in your collection. You'll notice that the red ones are labelled as star objects. Obviously at the beginning, when you're faced with a collection as incredible as this, you think of every object almost as a star object and you imagine that it would be best seen in a round, but it doesn't take much playing with the objects to realise that most of them do actually need a backdrop and a sculptural ensemble of other objects around them in order to be really seen. So that was a completely new discovery for me. I thought at first we'd want lots of cases in the round where you could walk around the objects from all sides, but actually they often look better against the right backdrop. So through all this um, testing and coming up with different options, we came to this basic concept. And the concept of the design was really to integrate the whole collection. And it was integrating the different types of objects um, within the collection themselves, and also to make sure that then felt as part of the room. And the way we did this really was to line the two long sides of the walls in the room with these bronze panels, which are floated in front of the bookcases. Into these we inserted what we described as wall showcases, and in them we, we displayed the smaller objects, such as jewellery, those with particular lighting requirements and those which have their own narrative story. In the centre of the room, these three large rhomboid-shaped showcases um, the, their scale is really important, as they, they allow us to mix large groups of the objects together, really mass them, give them a, a sculptural sense, and therefore start to create different links within different groups of the collection. Their sort of scale and their shape, which leads you around the gallery, then creates small pockets or, or rooms within the room, in which, in which we're allowed or able to pull out small wall um, showcases from the walls. And that allows us to show some of the smaller objects, such as the jewellery, which we want to see from both sides, or the box with micro carvings, where you can really look at the, the minutiae of the, the detail from both sides. The um, Holy Thorn uh, Reliquary, which is, uh, I think, a star real star object for this gallery, sits on its own right by the front, and that helps lead you around to the left as you enter. Um, one thing I think is quite interesting to note at this point, really, is the floor. Um, and you'll see around the outside of the floor, there's a slate um, perimeter. And there was also originally um, two slate we described as train tracks leading down either side of the centre of the gallery. And then in between that, there was actually what turned out to be a post-war pine infill. 
Um, already at this early contact stage, we were starting to look at how we might work with this. Because as you move around the gallery, if, if, it's, if the floor is like demarcated into different zones of pine and slate, it really actually quite subtly influences how you perceive the space, and it starts to divide the gallery into a different number of different zones. So already at this early stage, we were looking at how we might make it a more unified space. We were looking at filling that central plan with slate. And as we carried on, we decided that the whole gallery should have a slate floor with a real, real weighty feel to it, so it felt so solid. I just wanted to say that this is a, a view down into the first model that Stanton Williams made. Um, to help work out the concept and to explain to me and the patrons and the people in the British Museum how the gallery might work and what we were aiming for. And it was an incredibly useful tool uh, within the museum to persuade one's colleagues about what one was doing and to also include our patrons and state stakeholders in a much more meaningful way. Uh, what Tom says about the floor, you'll see later when you see photographs of the gallery with its slate floor. That slate floor creates a marvellous sense of unity, but also of gravity for the objects, a sense of stillness and calm, which is very valuable for looking at an, uh, a collection like this one. One other thing to say briefly is that actually this is a cul-de-sac, so it's not a, not a through route, and that, I think that was very really important, important. Allowing, allowing people to dwell in the gallery and really focus on the objects rather than people just rushing through to the next gallery. So this is the completed gallery, and I hope you get a sense of that Schatz kind of feel of the, this glimmering mass of objects with a quite a low light level, but then sculpturally massed together. You see one other thing which is really unique in this gallery, which is we also have a view out to the colonnade beyond. So you see up from those windows there, you get a chance to see where you are and orientate yourself to the museum, which are otherwise is quite a disorientating place to be. We know from our frequent visitor surveys that we do that if people can see out onto the colonnade and know exactly where they are physically within the museum, it's a very relaxing thing and it calms people down, slows their viewing, because they know it's only two minutes to a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> very important. <coughs> and you see here I hope how the forms also give you a bit of a sense of a route through the gallery and how that floor, um, the slate floor, steps up within the showcases and the whole room really feels a unified whole. Um, these cases didn't get to that quite that easily though. Um, they began life as what we describe as a kind of angel of the north like cantilever, so the idea that these two arms of the case would float out and the floor would run between them. This is one bit of the gallery where you found actually a lot of dialogue with yeah. the Rothschild Foundation actually. The funders were really pushing us and making sure this design was the best it could be. Lord Rothschild was very keen and absolutely right about this, that he wanted one to walk into the gallery and take in the whole collection at first glance, so you feel almost as if you were enveloped by the objects and the collection as a whole. So he wanted maximum transparency in the cases and to use the full volume of the cases from the top to the bottom. These are massive cases, as you'll know if you've visited the gallery. Um, at first that was quite a design challenge and also quite a curatorial challenge because we only display objects at hip level or above for obvious display reasons. Um, but it was a really, really good uh, thing to have to work out very early on in the process. Well, as we were being challenged by this, we um, came up with a very strange paradox that the larger the cases became, the more transparent they became as well. So you can see on the, on the right here is the final design concept we have, which is this idea of a, a sculptural glass prism uh, in which there are these floating back panels. So actually it's entirely made of structural glass. There's, there is still structure in the base and at the top, but actually holding the, the case up is pure structural glass, which is a, a big design challenge. These back talk about the glass. I oh, will get on to that. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the back panels themselves are offset, which then starts to give you really, um, they give the opportunity to display objects close up or further away, depending on how they sit, and also to give you really beautiful oblique yes. views through the gallery to other bits of the collection. Now this um, opportunity to work in the uh, room itself was really useful, especially understanding the bookcases and the bronze panels. Um, the gallery is grade one listed, um, and so it's really important to us that everything can be put back um, in the same 25, 30 years time when, when it needs to be next to relook up again. And so we were able to model all the bronze panels and the wall cases at full size just using cardboard in the bookcases. You see on the right here one of our models. And the reason why these panels are floated in front of the bookcase presses is that we're able, in that 10 centimetre zone, to conceal all the cabling routes, all the lighting, all the locks, all those conditioning requirements which are vast at the moment in, in exhibition um, gallery spaces. So 
we're able to use, have all these bits of infrastructure positioned somewhere which doesn't then need to have extra holes drilled through the book process. So it's a, a really important uh, aspect of conservation of the room. And as, as um, Dora mentioned, um, Jeremy as well, as well, this is a large conservation project and we were really fortunate to be working with Dussel conservation architects throughout and they did a fantastic job doing things which um, hopefully you actually see. Um, a large amount of this conservation work is really about trying to make it not visible. So um, they've replaced <coughs> what were modern windows with historic ones. They've done a lot of work um, straightening out of a sagging balcony um, and also repairing the vast amount of uh, very fragile timber work. One thing which you won't see at all though is the floor structure. Um, and what you see here is what the floor structure was previously. Um, and it's a really beautiful set of brick vaulted arches, um, which was from the original 1827 design. But these of course were designed to hold people sitting at desks reading books. And each of those large rhomboid cases weighed about five tonnes. So you can imagine that this, this structure was probably not going to hold that. And so what, what now exists in addition to this structure, so that, that's remained, we haven't, we haven't removed it, we've modified it a little bit. There's a separate steel, steel structure for every, every showcase which is then isolated from the rest of the floor which people sat which means that when you walk around the gallery, um, you don't transfer vibrations from your walking into the cases. That's so obviously that's very important for the safety and security of the objects, that there should be minimal vibration. And then as the large rhomboid cases um, developed, so did these peninsula cases. You see on the left here this idea of one which was cantilevered out from the bronze panels. Um, the main challenge with these wasn't, wasn't actually the structural challenge of, of um, hanging them from a wall, but actually how you display such small objects in such a large case. I mean, the, the, the minutiae of these, um, the jewellery and the boxwoods, uh, in such a, actually quite a big case, so you can get the lighting working was a real challenge. <coughs> and it was only when we really worked with the display case manufacturers that we came up with a final solution, which you'll see later on, where there's a central blade of, of a clear acrylic of which shelves were cantilevered and we can start to pin objects to them. It's, I think it's important to say at this early stage here, although these look like quite simple models of the forms of the cases, we're also al already trying to understand where the labels go, where the lights are, so make sure that already we're thinking about all of this. We knew these were going to be the hardest cases to design, partly because of the conservation and display needs of these very small and intricate objects. And I think it was probably the most complicated part of the entire gallery scheme, but we'll talk more about it. Um, for us, it was really important that these cases would be really beautiful in their own right, even before um, these objects yes. were put in there. And they're very minimal designs because the complexity of the objects, I think, just needed a very soft uh, background behind them. For that reason, the details are really critical, um, making sure that the details of the cases served the viewing of the objects and also didn't interrupt that. So, for example, there's no trying not to position objects with a, a, a large joint behind them which would kind of bisect or decapitate some of the objects. Um, we did this in the same way we did with all our building projects, making full sized models of almost every single detail in the gallery. So, you can see here just cardboard versions in our studio looking at how the holy thorn reliquary would sit on a plinth with an inset label bar. And this was then done in tandem with the showcase manufacturers. We were working with a company called Gopium based in Milan. Uh, they're really real Italian craftsmen and designers. And it was great working with their uh, director, Sandro, who's got a, a um, very strong interest in himself in the work of Carlo Scarpa, which is also a big interest for our office. So really nice to work with a company whose um, architectural ideas are very similar to our own. And so we were designing, making these mock models to design the details, and they would make a full size prototype of the real materials, and there was a lot of back and forth between London and Milan trying to um, resolve these details. There are only about two or three companies in the world that are capable of designing and building cases of this complexity and scale. Um, and one of the things that they did um, is this uh, door mechanism that you see on the right hand side. Now, that sheet of glass, which is a door in the case, is about four meters long and about three meters high. It weighs over half a ton. And it was really important that, that everyone could get access to a full size of the case for the museum team's work. So they designed a complete new um, opening mechanism here, which is inspired by how a coach door opens. And in one single movement, and with a touch of a button, that entire sheet of glass slides and pivots 
and ends up parallel to the short end of the display case, meaning that the museum team can have access to the case. That is particularly important to the British Museum because you may have noticed if you go around the museum that objects go in and out of the cases all the time for conservation reasons, for students <coughs> to see things, for photography, for loans to international exhibitions. And so going constantly in and out of the cases but manoeuvring the objects safely is a first requirement. These cases are built to last. They can't just be beautiful, they must be very functional and that was very much a part of the design brief. And of course, also working with this, uh, their workshop, we have the um, whole range of materials which we could try out. And this is one example where, working with Dora and her team, uh, we started to look at opportunities to light the objects, um, not only from the lights above them, but also trying to reflect light up onto the objects. We, we found through our mock-ups with Dora that if you could just reflect a tiny amount of light up onto the lower side of the objects, it just lifted them, gave them a bit more life. This is Paul Williams. Um, experiment from Stanton Williams experimenting with different finishes that reflect light in different degrees up against objects. And it was that kind of thoughtfulness and care and meticulousness that goes into the display of each object. Uh, this design development carried on throughout the project. So here we're about, uh, I guess, a week or two away from starting to install the objects. And the entire team is really involved at this point. Um, so Dora was down every day uh, with myself and the, the others from the team. I think just we were practically living in the gallery at this point. It was, there's a whole range, not just the case manufacturers, but also the um, conservation architects um, and the, the main contractors working on the building as well. And as Dora said, a whole range of interlocking teams. There's a real commitment from all involved to make sure that we had the best quality, and there's a huge amount of coordination making sure everything came together. I frequently had to translate from the Italian case builders to other people on the team. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, Tom and I have been talking a lot about the sculptural arrangement of the objects and the design of the cases, but you also have to think about the labelling all the way through, from the very, very beginning. The interpretation for the gallery is in several layers. It starts with the actual labelling of the objects, which is integral to the whole design concept, and it moves up to the digital interpretation, which I mentioned at the outset, you know, the sense of a, a visual impression of life at Wadsden and the previous social and political life of these objects before they became public property in the British Museum. And here you see Paul Williams at the top left from Stanton Williams Architects, um, working out the angle and the height of the backlit labels in those huge rhomboid cases. Um, and this is how we planned them. The writing had to be uh, to a template, so I had to write to the size available. We had to work out the, the sizes in the font that we were going to use. There are all kinds of access requirements. People inside the museum who are very concerned about these, these being able to be read by very many different kinds of people with different visual impairments. You have to think about all of those things and you have to get the design past all of those different audiences. And of course, the way that you group the objects affects the way you label them. The way you need to label the objects affects the way you group them. So it's again, not a linear process. And you have to keep thinking together all the time with the 2D designers, um, as well as the 3D designers. Here you see Ian Cartledge from Cartledge Levine, our wonderful 2D designers who worked on all the graphics in the gallery thinking about the sizing and the positioning of the numbering for the objects so that people can make the quickest possible relationship between the number of an object and its label. It's very basic, but it's actually very complex. And it affects also how, how you position the objects very much. Very much so. Uh, this is really just to show you how complex some of the objects are. This is a, a, a small box called Tabernacle. It's only this size. Absolute masterpiece of carving from the Northern Netherlands, about 1500, a very rare object. And obviously you just can't show it permanently open like this. You can't handle it and take it apart for visitors. So we've done that digitally. We've done that on these very small screens, of which there are six. They were planned from the very outset of the gallery. I knew exactly what I wanted to go on each of those screens from the beginning, which objects <coughs> would be featured, which angles we would need. And those screens are very carefully uh, designed into the gallery. The aim, Tom will talk about them more in a minute, but the aim is to help you look, to slow down your looking, to send you back to the object, understanding what it is that you're seeing. Of course, the digital display is one of the first things that will go out of date in the gallery. 
Um, so these are being carefully designed and stored from the beginning so that they are removable and replaceable without interfering with the design. We felt it was very important, given the complexity and the small scale of the objects which we're looking at, that the screens themselves would be very small and supple. So therefore we've, we've um, selected the smallest high definition screen available in the world and they play very subtly. Now they only start playing when you walk past them and the sensor activates them. So it's really about trying to have them in the background to, to complement the objects. Mm -hmm. They're also silent and we slowed them down through five different sets of edits to slow them down enough to encourage you to slow down in your looking because everything we're doing in this gallery is to help people see and to help people look. And as Els Gombrich long ago said, you only see what you already know. So these films are a very important tool for helping you understand your looking and to help inform what you see. And of course, a large part of this brief was really about trying to bring the character and personality of both Farron Ferdinand and Boston Manor into the gallery. And we felt that there was a really good opportunity in the existing book presses to do this. So for example, where there wasn't a bronze panel, we started to incorporate quotes from Baron Ferdinand in his Red Book, and also his contemporary images from Watson Manor. And we found this, working with uh, Cutler Javine and graphic designers, a really beautiful technique, which is printing black and white images onto frosted gray acrylic. And then when lit from behind, that has a really soft, kind of daguerreotype feel. So it gives you a bit of the atmosphere in the room. It was wonderful to be able to bring Baron Ferdinand's own voice into the room in his writing on collecting. He writes a lot about what collecting meant to him, about his mistakes as a collector, about his relationships with dealers and other members of his family. And it's lovely to be able to bring those into the room and to feel that connection with him. And of course, a big question as to what do we do with the upper part of the gallery. It's a large space and really what can go up there. We spend a long time thinking about whether or not we should have graphics which relate to the gallery and the collection, or whether we should have some contemporary art there which might in some way refer to it. Or do we just leave it as a, as a library in the memory of its original use as a library. And we felt that given the amount of information and, and complexity at the ground floor, the upper space should really be quite calm and therefore we reinstated the library. However, of course, we, as we went to, we found this opportunity there, which was to, um, you, when you go to the gallery, you'll see that the south end of the gallery, uh, at the upper level, the book's all white. And that gives us a great opportunity to project images onto this and give some context to the collection. Well, these are fake book backs. I don't think you've said that explicitly. Yeah. These are fake book backs used as a projection screen. And again, a lot of thought went into what the imagery of the film should be that's projected onto that screen. It fades, it comes and goes, it fades back into the books, and it comes out again and shows you, gives you a very strong impression of Wadsden Manor as um, a privileged visitor. And it shows you the future King of England, Edward VII, as the Prince of Wales, best friend of Baron Ferdinand, frequent visitor to Walston. It shows him sitting in a striped deck chair alongside his mistresses or playing tennis on the lawns and gives you a sense of the incredible corporate entertaining, the elite corporate entertaining, enlightened corporate entertaining of Walston, where these objects previously were. And so it does that incredible thing of making that connection with Walston and making you understand how these objects have travelled from this rather wonderful entertaining space to the modern public museum. So alongside all this showcase design and all the interpretation, of course, is how the objects sit together. And I think as we, as we knew that this is an old, a collection that's very unique and it's fixed, so unlike a Roman collection or an Egyptian one, if they find a new wall of coins, nothing's going to change in this collection. It's not going to need to move anything around. And with this idea of the chat's kind of feel as well, it meant that we were really trying to position every object in its own unique position. And the only way you can really do that is to actually do it physically. And so, for that reason, we made full-size life, sort of full life-size cardboard cutouts of every single object. And you see two of them here. Um, this one, which is the Sybil's casket, I believe. The back can see, yeah. And um, you can see it's the, the front floor, but also the depth of it. And using these cardboard cutouts, we were able to make a whole range of mock-ups. And so, throughout the project, we did um, five mock-up <laughs> uh, rounds, mock-ups in total with each different iteration of the, of the showcase design. And the cardboard cutouts were really critical because, of course, moving real museum objects is an incredibly labour-intensive and very fragile task. Um, and of course, Dora's team was very careful not to move the objects any more than they have to be moved. And just 
you or I can just pick up these around, move them around, stick them to the back panels, and very quickly understand how you can mass the objects together. It has to be said, though, that these are not substitutes for the real objects. They're only useful if you know the objects. Um, but they are reminders of the kinds of space and the kind of object and how you have to think about it, all the things that you need to think about when displaying that object. What kind of mount is it going to have? What kind of shelf is it going to be on? What height is it going to be at? What conservation requirements does it have? What lighting requirements does it have? And only if you know the object already can this be of use. But of course, moving the objects around is involving uh, one of the 10 teams I mentioned at the beginning. And it's an incredibly complex process. And the British Museum is doing many other things at the same time. So you do need to be very organised about that, and these objects certainly helped, these cutouts helped greatly. And with these mock-ups, I guess what we're really looking at is the idea of a sculptural composition. Um, so as I said earlier, this idea of a compromise when you position an object in a fixed location in a showcase. So we're trying to understand what height they should be at, how much breathing space is around them, how they group together, and, and sort of how they're lit. Uh, you see me looking very concentrated and very nervous here because um, I'm handling some of the most uh, fragile and important and valuable and precious uh, tall silver gilt standing cups, which are massive and very heavy, um, but I'm deciding to mix in this beautiful 15th century Venetian glass, which is even rarer, which our marvellous lead conservator, Denise Ling, is holding carefully here while I get the mount for it into position. And there you understand the importance of having these cutouts in order to handle the object safely when you're mingling and matching in this way. Of course, I understand the lighting is very important. And these mock-ups are really critical in making sure that we're able to, that the display cases are able to light the objects properly. I think in particular, the wall cases where we had the rock crystals, and these have never really been properly lit before in the museum. There's a huge complexity in them, both the how each object is carved, um, which has a different way of lighting, and also the gold mounts with enamels on them. And one thing you may not notice, but it's quite subtly done in the gallery, is that the cases with rock crystals in them are the only ones which have a cooler light temperature. So everything else has got quite a warm uh, temperature, a uh, warm colour of light, but these ones are just cooled down. That really helps make the crystals sing. Absolutely. I have to say, I think that the amber, you just see the base of an amber tankard that is uplit from the base. I have to say, I think we've lit the amber really well, and, and that's been a great joy to be able to do that, because amber is very hard to display and very hard to see. And on the left, you see Paul Williams of Stanton Williams Architects. Um, with me, uh, I'm handling one of these miniature boxwood carvings, and he's angling the light into it to see what's the best angle to both display the object and to fix the lighting, so that you can really see into the depth of the carving. Or using these really to develop the designs of the cases. As these mock-ups carried on, of course, we were really trying to understand these final positions of the objects. So um, you see my very um, beautiful drawings of these chickens up there. Um, it was really, one of the main things about this design, is, as it was so bespoke, every single element was pre-manufactured in Italy and brought across. So once it was built, there was very little room for manoeuvre, and everything therefore had to be very carefully positioned. Um, you can see here on the left, for example, we were marking out on the shelves, um, how how large the shelf should be around the objects. And of course, this, al alongside this is a lot of dialogue with the conservation team at the museum, understanding how fragile objects can be supported, but also bringing in external mount makers in addition to the museum's team. And these mount makers um, made small brackets, and most of the objects you see don't just sit on the shelves, but they have a small little bracket somewhere which fixes them and restrains them, holding them safely there. And of course, they needed to come in and handle the objects too, to make sure they understood how the objects behave. I must say they were wonderful to work with and made it a very easy process, but as a result, the objects are now very securely held and mounted in this gallery. Well, this is really just to show uh, one of the most problematic areas of the entire display, both in terms of the research and the thinking and in the actual display. The jewellery is a very important part of the Wollaston Bequest. Baron Ferdinand loved jewellery, he loved collecting it, he also loved wearing it. And there are many photographs of him dressed up in Renaissance costume, looking fairly ridiculous, uh, wearing wonderful hat badges on his hat, a bit like the ones in the Wollaston Bequest. Um, and so that fashion for wearing jewellery, I think, helps to explain how, from the early 19th century, the the wish to collect objects, fantastic jewels of the Renaissance, simply outstripped the supply of the real objects. 
And there are people in the back streets of Paris who will improve a damaged Renaissance tool for you or create a new one from nothing, um, especially if it's covered with most incredible emeralds, like this ramp of faith, this uh, wonderful pregnant mermaid. She's got, I'm holding her in my hand here, she's got um, fantastic emeralds, I think 21 emeralds all over her body, cabochon emeralds, and a fantastic huge cabochon emerald for her pregnant stomach on her front. Um, but this is a 19th century object, and we've been able to prove that through the research on the gallery and the book that I've written to accompany the, the new display. But what I'm trying to do here, wearing my gloves, and it's actually a surprisingly awkward thing, is to work out the point of balance for this object. And it really makes the point that handling the objects tells you so much about them and their history, particularly the jewels, because it helps to work out whether an object is a genuine Renaissance piece or a rather crude 19th century forgery or pastiche. This one, despite the fact that it looks so sculptural, is rather crudely two-dimensional and doesn't have a very good point of balance. In other words, it's not really designed to be worn. It's designed to be shown off. At first, we thought we'd display these jewels so you could see them on both sides, and we hung them at what we thought was the right viewing height on fishing line to get the right kinds of heights. That was quite a delicate procedure. Um, and here you see the finished result, which Tom can explain uh, how we did that. So this idea of the um, case which we came to working with um, Gokke and case manufacturers was that the central blade of acrylic we, we then found there, and by drilling into those we could then put very careful, very small pins which would hold each object. I think it's quite a challenge for, I still said about this idea of the point of balance for every object having to be found for every single one. And here you see our senior museum assistant Jim Peters, one of the incredibly experienced and skilled team of specialist uh, technicians. You see him actually putting in the, uh, plastic, the plastic dowels into the perspex to secure these, every object securely. That took, I think it took a day, didn't it, just to do this one case. So that gives you some sense of the kinds of skills and the kinds of planning that needs to be in place. Now the installation of the gallery is also a very important and really critical part of the critical phase. Um, us architects were still in there, I, I had the fortune to have a desk in the corner of the gallery for about a month and a half, <laughs> spending every day in the museum, which is a really privileged place to work. Um, and I was still there, uh, I think the museum assistants are probably fed up with my voice by now, I'm saying left a bit, right a bit, up a bit, <laughs> down a bit, no, not quite. And you can see we were still using these cardboard cutouts to position objects, making sure that, they, that their, the designs are working well. We're also still using these full-size drawings, especially with the pinning of the objects. And you see here the museum assistants doing something very unusual, which is pinning onto vertical metal. Um, normally they pin onto sloped fabric back panels, but in this idea of the unity of the case, it was really important that, that there wasn't a, a distinguishing uh, different material onto which they go. We were asking a lot of these teams of technicians because uh, drilling and pinning objects vertically into metal doesn't allow for any error. You have to be able to do it right the first time. And it's a laborious process. And you can see on the left, this is the layout of the uh, cutlery in the collection, the wonderful embellished knives, spoons, and forks. And they're being pinned individually. They're finding the right place for the pins through the paper so that they'll know exactly where to drill. And this is the object that's shown on its own, the Holy Thorn Reliquary, at the entrance to the gallery. And the reason why this object's shown on its own is because it really encapsulates the story of the collection. It's really about the um, passion that the, the Rothschilds had for collecting treasures of the late Middle Ages. This is the Holy Thorn Reliquary of Jean Duc de Berry, allegedly made in Paris in around 1390, to hold a thorn from the crown of thorns worn by Christ at his crucifixion. That's the story. And it's a jewel. It's only about this high. But on the other side of the collection of the case, we tell a fascinating story about how the real object, this object, which was in Vienna in the 19th century, uh, was lent or sent for repair to Salomon Weininger, an unscrupulous restorer, who copied the original and gave back the copy to the museum in Vienna and sold the original, which slowly found its way into the Rothschild collection. So the story is really both about that Rothschild relationship to the great art of the Middle Ages and of the Renaissance, but also about their relationship with the art market, the perils of collecting and the dangers of forgery in this period when the art market is really taking off in Europe. 
So this one object tells that story, and we do it through labels on both sides of the case, which tell the two parts of that story. What you don't see here, actually, um, which only came out after taking the photograph, is um, a small mirror. And as you see at the centre of the object is the, small, is the, hawk, the thorn, which is uh, supposedly from the, the crown of thorns. And as we install this, this is one of the objects which is so fragile that we didn't really have a chance to look at it in advance. As we installed it and looked at how the lighting was working, we realised that if we just were able to reflect a little bit of light up into that central thorn, you could really see into that space. And that's one of those places where no matter how much work you do testing things out, there's always something which you can uh, come across at the last minute. And so we, just, we really had to be able to respond to these opportunities. He did that, that, he put that little piece of metal in the morning of the opening of the gallery. <coughs> And so, almost really just to leave you with an idea of the sculptural, um, the sculptural design of the showcase and the, and the objects. And I think, um, so we've spoken a little bit about this idea of sculptural massing, but I think it's useful to understand quite what we mean by it. So this is the first case as you went to the gallery. It's a real mixture of the collection, so it's important for us that, that you get a sense of every different type of object on display. So the, on the right hand side there's this large skeezy shield, and that um, holds its own really in the case. It's kind of, it's, it, we feel it acts as a kind of punctuation mark. There's an arc of ostrich eggs and other curiosities around that which help lead you across to the left. In between these two back panels there, there's large Maolica vases which have a real mass to them. They kind of arrest your gaze as you enter the uh, gallery. But not only that, but they also help you help lead your eye further beyond. So you see that right at the back of the gallery, there are a couple of Maolica vases there, so you're already able to make connections between different parts um, of the gallery, and also with other objects within the case. So there's, on the back of this case, there's a couple of objects which relate to the Maolica vases, um, being from Horace Walpole. To the left of that, there's a, this writing cabinet, which um, is one of the few places where we've displayed objects like they would have been displayed at the smoking room, so showing smaller objects on top of the cabinet. And in front of it, this, these two book covers from the Old Gospels, which are showed as though on a lectern. And underneath that lectern, we concealed a couple of lights, which were able to shine some lights up into the writing cabinet, so you could really see the detail there. This reliquary of some Valerie then holds its own, and it, I think especially with that light coming in and glancing on top of it, it really has a strong presence, and it's able to then fill that triangular portion of the case. And just around the corner, you can spot um, what's a small mortgage <coughs> shell. That's using this, this small angle and the acute angle of the case to really um, get close to the objects. These two stags above there <coughs> and the, of course the chamfer of the case start to lead you around into the rest of the gallery. I think we'll just, sorry, the next one. Um, we talked a little bit about the problem of displaying jewellery given that so much of it is 19th century and not Renaissance. Um, I just wanted to end by, by showing you a picture of the cover of the book that I wrote for the collection, which I hope some of you will have seen or might like to look at. Um, it was Neil McGregor's genius, I think, to come up with this title, A Rothschild Renaissance, which I think encapsulates the nature of the book. <coughs> that relationship, as I've mentioned before, between the Rothschild and the Renaissance is this cultural period they really wanted to understand and connect their family history with, but also their relationship to the art market, the sense of refashioning and remaking themselves as a family. Um, so he chose this particularly beautiful pendant, which is only this big, uh, to go on the front. And when I pointed out that it's one of the 19th century forgeries and not one of the Renaissance originals, he said, but that's fine if we call it the Rothschild Renaissance. It, it covers both things and we can integrate the things properly. I think that was a really fantastic <coughs> directorial decision. I think we use this image very successfully in all our marketing and, and merchandise and on the underground. And it's certainly been something that has arrested people's attention in encapsulating the story of the Rothschild relationship to the Renaissance, which is the story of this gallery. Now I realize that we've done an incredibly uh, intense scamper through three and a half years of work, uh, but we really wanted to share it with you in order to stimulate any questions you may have but also to encourage you to keep in touch with the gallery, look at the web page for it, maybe look at the book, and really just understand a little bit more what it takes to create something that is free, public and permanent.